from the rafters of Rupp is brought to you by Bud's Gun Shop, Don Franklin's Auto Mall, Double Dogs, Friends of Cole, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Kentucky Farm Bureau, Hello everybody and welcome to this edition of From the Rafters of Rupp. I'm Kyle Macy. If you've ever had the good fortune of attending a game in Rupp Arena, you probably know the rafters are a prime location for jerseys and championship banners. The players, coaches, announcer, and equipment manager that have their jerseys hanging there have had legendary careers representing the blue and white. Throughout this series, we'll hear from members of that select group as they give you a first-hand account of why their jerseys hang from the rafters of Rupp. In today's episode, I sit down with one of UK's all-time fan favorites and one of the best to ever wear the Kentucky blue and white. Wildcat fans flocked to Memorial Coliseum in the early 60s to watch Charles Cotton Nash fill the stat sheets every time he took the floor. His finesse around the basket, his ability to score, his knack for rebounding, all with a touch of brilliance and dazzle, made him a rock star around the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Cotton and I began our conversation talking about his childhood and the many roads he traveled in becoming one of the nation's most sought after high school basketball recruits. Also in this segment, he shares with me how and when he received his trademark nickname. I was born in New Jersey and uh, grew up right outside of New York City, right across the river. And when uh, us kids were playing sports, there was only one, and that was baseball because we were right in the shadow of Yankee Stadium and Ebbets Field and the Polo Grounds. And then there, were, there was Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays and Duke Snyder playing. And uh, that, was our, that was our dream and our goal. Everybody wanted to play Major League Baseball. Uh, then my father got transferred with his company to, uh, to Indiana. And when I got there, it, uh, they seemed to have a different sport they liked there, which was basketball. So I was a pretty tall kid for my class, so these, uh, these guys said, I think you, got, you better start playing basketball too. So I then started, I didn't start playing basketball until I was in uh, probably sixth grade. And our scores for some of the games were 10 to five, three to, one game was three to one. <laughs> so we, we must have played a lot of defense in those days. When I was uh, still in Little League, uh, in Jeffersonville, Indiana. It was a small town at the time in the sports uh, page. They didn't have a whole lot to cover and they covered Little League Baseball in the sports page. And they wrote up every game. They had box scores. They uh, had big articles on, on each, uh, each game. And one of those sports writers, when I was 12 years old, he, I had what pretty much, my, my blonde hair was pretty much white at the time, which is getting there again, so. <laughs> um, and then they, they uh, dubbed me uh, with the nickname Cotton and uh, wrote it up in the paper in the headlines sometimes when I had a good game, so. And then it stuck ever since. And then I, I played basketball for the Jeffersonville High School team and uh, actually we were, we were ranked pretty high in the state. Uh, we were in the top three for a good part of one year but we got beat in the semi-state. Final eight, we got beat, and uh, that was the uh, during the reign of the Crispus Attics. They were always the team to beat Indianapolis Crispus Attics. My father was then transferred again uh, to Louisiana. So I ended up my last two years in high school in Louisiana, and their emphasis down there, they only had one sport they liked, and that was football. <laughs> so, <laughs> I ended up on the football field for, for two years too, playing basketball, and they were so passionate about football in, those, in, in that area that they didn't even field a baseball team in my high school. They either wanted you to go out for spring football or run track to stay in shape for next fall's football season. <laughs> Uh, the school that most heavily recruited me was UCLA. John Wooden and his staff. In fact, those were the days when 
you could just about do anything in recruiting. And I, he, they flew me out there two or three times. They let me take a buddy, uh, gorgeous place, gorgeous campus, and uh, called me on the phone every night. And I, I had uh, offers from Big Ten schools, ACC schools, and uh, uh, Florida schools. But uh, I finally, I got to the point where if I was going to play basketball in college, I wanted to stay in the Southeast and in the SEC. And if you were a basketball player at that time, you really should go to the UK. <laughs> so that's how I ended up here. We'll have more with Cotton Nash right after these messages. Hunter Brothers Pizza has been proudly serving communities across America for over 25 years. Download the Hunt Brothers Pizza app to find one of our 7,500 locations inside a convenience store near you. Are you a sporting shooter, hunter, or looking for the best concealed carry option? Bud's Gun Shop and Range is Kentucky's largest selection of firearms, ammunition, and firearm accessories. Located on Industry Road in Lexington. Cotton Nash spent his first year at UK leading the freshman squad in scoring. He watched from the sidelines as the Varsity Cats finished their season with a 19-9 record. Cotton describes the team chemistry as he moved up to the varsity the following year. He recalls specific games of his sophomore season, and he remembers his frustration during an injury-plagued junior year, as well as sharing his thoughts on playing for the legendary coach, Adolph Rupp. Coach, there has been so much said and expected of Cotton Nash. I'd like here just a week before his first varsity game to hear how you sum up this boy from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Well, Claude, he's a natural, uh, as we say in sports. He does everything well. He's very clever. He's fast. He has a fine crossover step. He goes back to the basket with good speed. He can dribble. He's a fairly good defensive man. He's a very fine shooter, a fine free thrower. He could, if he has a desire, and I want to put it that way because I think it all rests on him from here on out, if he should want to do so, he could be one of Kentucky's all-time greats. Adolph and I saw eye to eye most of the time. We had a brief period there where we were, we didn't, in my junior year when I was hurt, he didn't think I was hurt that bad, but I was. <laughs> he expected more out of me uh, than I gave him, but um, he and I, I loved his efficiency. You knew when you had to be there, you knew, knew when you were getting off. Um, you weren't ha hassled in the off season. You were allowed to do what you wanted to, in my case, play baseball and track. And it, after a while, he just, he just uh, didn't coach me as much as he did the other guys. Because a lot of times I would play on instinct more than I did following a set pattern of plays. And it usually worked out for me, so he, he, he gave me the leeway to do that. We all seemed to mesh pretty well uh, as a team that year, and uh, I remember we did lose to the Southern Cal, and they had a big guy named John Rudimetkin at the time. He was a real good ball player, and he tore us up that that game. And I think we all learned something from it. But um, we never we didn't seem to have any problem. We all got along well, and uh, we won the SEC that year. And we went to the regionals, NCAA regionals, and we got knocked out by uh, some team that had these two guys named Jerry Lucas and John Havlicek. Mm -hmm. And what happened there was <laughs> uh, we were we got beat by 10 points in the regional by, uh, by Ohio State. And Havlicek held me to 10 points under my average. And they beat us 10 points. So Lucas had scored. Lucas, we didn't have anybody to guard him because our, our biggest guy was like 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. And he made like 12 out of 13 shots from the field. And Havlicek was just all over me, and uh, uh, they eliminated, eliminated us that year. We never did put it together that year. Yeah, yeah that was a really a, a jumbled up year. And I was injured most of the year, which uh, didn't help. I had a, a stone bruise on your heel. and. It was the only remedy for that was to rest it for two, three, four weeks. Of course, in the middle of the season, I couldn't do that. And so they tried these little donuts with uh, with foam on it to put in my shoe. And then finally, we got down to uh, 
I don't know if I should even say this, but uh, uh, Novocaine injections in my heel, just so I could go out there and run without, without pain. And uh, this lasted um, probably half the season. And then we didn't, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do that well that year. We lost nine or 10 games, I think. In the fall of 1963, Cotton Nash returned to campus healthy and ready for his final year at UK. We discussed the excitement surrounding his senior season, the style of play incorporated by the 63-64 Wildcat team, his teammates, and the most memorable moments of his last season in a Wildcat uniform. Yeah, right. They, they came to the Coliseum, I remember. Uh, had me over there in the afternoon taking all these different uh, photos and told me that it, it was going to be a cover shot. So I, it was right at the beginning of the season, yeah. I think the cover shot uh, was on in a December issue, I believe. But uh, yeah, that was exciting. And uh, in fact, I still, I still get some covers sent to me in the mail, wanting me to autograph them and mail them back. I love the practices. I don't think I could have put up with these two, three, four hour practices in today's game. But we, we got on the court at exactly 3.15 every day. We, um, everyone got a ball. Uh, everybody on the team got one ball. And everybody was required to shoot wherever their shots were from where the, when their locations were for 30 straight minutes and go get your own rebound. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried that, but at the end of 30 minutes, you've done a lot of work and a lot of conditioning. And then practice started. So uh, there was no need for any conditioning work after or before practice when you went through something like that. And then during practice, you were constantly moving either with uh, running plays or drills. Um, and at the end of practice, which uh, ended exactly at five o'clock, hour and 45 minutes later. Uh, you got off the court, you had to give time for the freshmen to get on the court so they could practice. And the other, the other reason was that the student union building where they fed us all closed right. <laughs> at, uh, at seven o'clock. So everybody had, the freshmen had to get their practice in, we had to get their, our practice in, get over and eat before they closed. Right. So uh, it was a pretty efficient time-sensitive uh, deal. Well, it was, uh, you had 12,000 people, and, and to me, I've been to a lot of games at Rupp Arena, but they were more energetic. A lot of times you'd be out there in the court, or no, not a lot, a very lot of, a lot of the times, and you couldn't hear yourself think sometimes because of the crowd noise, and you'd have to get right up next to your uh, teammate in order to communicate. And it was, it was a wonderful atmosphere in those days. We had a, a two six three forwards, Larry Conley and Ted Deacon. I was the six five center, and most of the time our guards were Randy Ambry, 5'10", and Terry Mobley, 6'1". And occasionally Tommy Cron started, and he was 6'4", and gave us a little more height in there. But, uh, but technically, Basically, we were smaller than the Rups and Runs, that's right. Uh, Jeff Mullins was their best player. Um, they had a guy named, uh, well, th that's a good story. Uh, Jeff was as big as I am, and uh, he was their guard. But they had a seven foot center, they had a 6'11 forward, and another 6'8 forward. And like I told you, our front line was 6'5, 6'3, 6'3. And somehow we managed to outgas them and outrun them and beat them. It's all over, and Kentucky has done it. What a comeback! Kentucky came from behind and has swept Duke 81 to 79. Well, it was a special game for me because of the uh, the last championship team was the 58 uh, Vernon Hunting team that won the national title, and this was six years later and we uh, I felt real proud that we had risen to the number one ranking uh, after all those years and brought Kentucky back to the number one ranking 
And yeah, we did beat Duke in that Sugar Bowl Classic, and the very next day we were ranked number one there. And here it is, Cotton Nash is the most valuable player of the Sugar Bowl tournament. Nash, the first half held at 10 points, came back with 20 points the second half as he guided Kentucky to that sensational come from behind 12 point victory. Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance, big on commitment. We never set out to be the largest auto dealer in Kentucky. He just set out to provide people reliable vehicles and great customer service. And for the last 50 years, that's what we've done. After graduating from Kentucky in the spring of 1964, the multi-talented Nash recalls that he had several options available as he considered his future job prospects. We examined his choices and the path his professional career followed after his time at the University of Kentucky ended. In the spring uh, after I graduated, I signed, uh, I had three options actually. I was actually uh, admitted to, I applied to and was admitted to the dental school here at University of Kentucky. My father always wanted me to be a dentist, so. And then I also had two contract offers, one from the Angels and one from the Lakers. So I was trying to figure out how to do all three, but that, that, <laughs> I couldn't put that on paper and make it work out. So I signed with the Angels and there was a lot of teams didn't want to touch me because they were afraid I'd play the other sport. Uh, the NBA teams were reluctant to draft me because they thought I'd, they knew I was going to play baseball and they thought I'd stay with it and vice versa. So I played that first year season uh, with, with the Angels minor league system. And then I reported immediately after uh, playing a hundred and some games uh, for them to the training, uh, NBA training camp. I played uh, Played the NBA season. Right after the last game, I reported again to spring training. And uh, after that season, I thought, well, it was it was more mental than physical. Right. I, I was just exhausted, so I had to choose one. So I stayed with the baseball. Yeah. A couple years later, I was um, I was with the White Sox in Chicago, and they had starting the ABA, and they were talking to me during the whole month of September about coming back and playing ba uh, basketball in Louisville. And I said, no, I said, I tried that before. I'm, I'm, not gonna do, I'm not gonna do them both again. So eventually I told them, uh, if I do play, I, this is what kind of a salary I would want. So I thought I scared them away. <laughs> but then the last week of the baseball season, they. They agreed to my uh, my uh, salary request, and three two weeks after the baseball season ended, I was playing in Louisville. I was in the starting lineup, the first ABA game, and played that whole season. The coal industry's had a big impact on my life. My grandfather was a coal miner. My father was a coal miner. Coal is the largest driving force in our local economy. That's why I'm a friend of coal. Double Dogs is a great place to eat. In a single word, delicious. An amazing athlete, Cotton spent five years dividing time between professional baseball and basketball before moving back to Lexington to work as a real estate investor in the early 1970s. Later he found success in the horse breeding industry and in 2010, Rock and Roll Heaven, a horse Cotton bred and raised, won the Horse of the Year Award. Still, Cotton reflects back on his time on UK's campus and the experiences that helped shape and mold the direction of his life. It's really, really different. Uh, I, we took a little car ride around the campus last fall. Um, and it was the first time I'd done that in years and years and years. And I, I had no idea where I was going. I mean, my, luckily, I, uh, somebody else was driving so I could look out the window and they'd say, well, that's where Hagen Hall used to be. That's where you used to live. And I said, man, not really. I thought it was over here. <laughs> so it's, it's a big difference, yeah. Well, they, were, they weren't any different. They were, they were really passionate. And uh, they, I got here 
uh, as a freshman, of course, and uh, I had a little advanced publicity, so there was a lot of people wanting to meet me. And they came up and introduced themselves, and uh, I've run into a lot of people on the campus and on the, in downtown and everything, and finally I got to the point where I was trying to remember everybody's name, but <laughs> it got to the point where, and I, it's carried over into my life today, too. I can't remember anybody's name when they introduced <laughs> me because it was too difficult. Coming here to school was a big deal for me. I met my wife here about 50 years. Uh, and I thought I got a good education. And it was a springboard to professional ball. Uh, I don't think I could have done any better at UCLA, even though Wooden really wanted me bad. But he didn't really need me because uh, my senior year is well, his first, uh, he won his first title. So he didn't really need me that bad after all. If they had a big guy at center, like most of the teams we played, uh, they did have a guy at least 6'8", six, 6'9", six, in, the, in the post and matched up with me at center. So what I do, I just take him outside and dribble around him and uh, I was a little too quick for everybody in those days. And then if they had a smaller one, I'd post up a lot and shoot my hook shot um, and hopefully get fouled. I did go to the free throw line quite a bit. Um, but most of the time, the other team that was most effective on me was they put a little guard on me and he'd stand right in my chest the whole game, <laughs> regardless of where the ball was. And he didn't know where the ball was either. He didn't care where the ball was. He was just standing right in my chest the whole game and followed me wherever I went on the floor. That was their, that was the, the biggest uh, defense that gave me trouble. Cotton Nash. He's one of only 12 athletes to have played and performed on both NBA and Major League Baseball rosters. He was a high school parade All-American, a three-time All-SEC first team selection, a three-time All-American, and the number 12 overall pick by the Los Angeles Lakers in the 1964 NBA draft. His 22.7 career points per game average ranks him second on Kentucky's all-time list in that category, just behind career-leading scorer Dan Issel. In fact, both scoring machines wore the number 44 jersey during their playing days at the University of Kentucky. Today, when fans look up and see the number 44 Nash nice jersey hanging in the top of Rupp Arena, they'll recall the flash, the flair, and the scoring ability of the one and only Charles Cotton Nash. Thanks for joining us, everybody. That'll do it for this season of shows. We hope you'll join us again next season as we continue to talk with those Kentucky legends who have their jerseys hanging from the rafters of Rupp. From the rafters of Rupp was brought to you by Bud's Gun Shop, Don Franklin's Auto Mall, Devil Dogs, Friends of Cole, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Kentucky Farm Bureau, and by Rafferty's.